I'd like to take a minute to talk about one of our sponsors, Parker Sporlin and Thermostatic Expansion Valves. How can you guys always have the right thermostatic expansion valve for the right application without having to carry hundreds of valves in your truck? Well, that's simple. Using Sporlin's interchangeable cartridge style valves. The Q valve for conventional and the BQ valve for balance port. It, it, it's as easy as one, two, three. It serves thousands of unique applications. So one, you just select a thermostatic element for your application. Two, you select the body style you need. Three, you select the right size cartridge for the application. These easy to select and assemble valves mean you always have the right valve for the job on your truck. For more information on the Q and BQ valves, visit Sporland.com. Thanks guys, enjoy the episode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. You're here with your host, Brett Wetzel and Kevin Compass. Hey, How's Brett, how's it going? Uh, it's going. It's going. Um, as you guys have been seeing out there, we started doing uh, EMS videos, um, you know, specifically right now, uh, E2 videos. We will be, you know, uh, building on that. We will be doing Danfoss stuff. Um, we're going to do some S3C stuff. We're going to be doing some KE2 stuff. Um, so the videos are coming, guys, uh, now that we finally get everything set up and raring to go. Um, please, if you guys, there's something that you want to request, uh, send an email uh, to advancedrefrigerationpodcast at gmail.com or make a, make a suggestion on the advanced Facebook group, um, the Facebook group. And we'll, uh, you know, we're going to start releasing those every week uh, on Monday morning. Um, so podcast will be releasing on Sunday. And then the EMS or whatever video you guys want to see will be uh, releasing on Mondays. Uh, Kevin, what do you got going on this week, man? Oh, we're in uh, full rack change out mode. So today we demoed out an entire rack and uh, the rest of the week was doing some like pre prep piping work. And uh, we're back to crazy hours again. We had like a week of like nice hours. Now it's back to, uh, behind the eight ball and uh working 60 plus hours a week again sounds fun yeah. uh, <laughs> i am i'm currently making some videos for work um you know on top of you know us making the videos for for you guys um just doing doing some you know trying to write some technical documentation how to do a, uh, a good pm you know stuff like that um but tonight we're going to be talking about defrost clocks and, you know, different ways that they can terminate. Uh, we might, if we have enough time for tonight, maybe we might get into, you know, how a case controllers defrost as well. But let's get started. So on the defrost clocks, typically, um, you have uh, a couple different uh, points on there. If we're talking about a Paragon, um, you usually have the <clears throat> number one. Uh, and number two, those are what give the power to uh, terminals uh, three and four. Three and four, yeah, normally open and normally close sets of contacts. Number three is a normally open. Four is normally closed. So four would typically be used for your refrigeration, for your evaporator fan motors. And three is going to be used for your uh, defrost solenoid, defrost contactor. Um, because you know those are things that we don't run running if the if the defrost clock actually goes into you know if it if it fails we don't want it failing uh, on with the heat on and heating up the product uh, we want it to fail uh, normally closed so that's why you know we we hook up the refrigeration uh, excuse me and the fan to the um, to the terminal number four um, then we also have a N which is neutral. Um, and then we have an X for termination. Not every single time, not every single defrost clock has an X for termination. Um, you know, sometimes they don't they don't have any kind of termination on there. So it's just basically it's a timed uh, defrost clock. Uh, so you have to be mindful to make sure you know those numbers uh, all mean something. So we have like uh, what is it? Uh, 80, uh, 8145 and 8045. 
um which i what what is that what does that uh dictate on the on that number because one dictates the the control voltage power and the so other one at the end like it uh 81 45 20 would be a 208 clock okay um and 80 45 zero, zero, I do believe is a 120 volt clock. Um, wait, no, in 8140 41 in an 81 41 20 looks to be a 120 volt clock. I'm gonna be honest, I haven't touched a defrost clock in like two and a half years. <laughs> Um, but yeah, not, not every single one has a termination, uh, set of context as well. Um, you know, I had a, I had a guy that called me up the, the one day when I was up in Connecticut and he proceeds to tell me that he hooked up a defrost clock, but the terminal that it's hooked up to is glowing orange whenever it goes into defrost. And, you know, I asked him, I was like, is it the same exact clock? Yep. looks exactly the same, which they will. Um, but this is one of the ones that didn't have a, uh, termination set of context where x wasn't the term uh termination for the defrost uh x was actually the neutral on this particular clock so he had a direct short and basically whenever this thing would go into defrost it would just the terminal block would just glow bright orange um so you, you have to be mindful you know you can look at the directions uh look at the wiring schematic that typically comes with it um but you can also look at the back of the clock and actually see how it's wired um this does have a uh a timer or i'm sorry a time clock on there like a bit basically a gear set motors that make uh this this uh clock actually you know turn it's pretty powerful it's a very low amperage uh you know typically a lot of problems that you have is where you know if you have a short or something or it just finally wears out the defrost uh, clock motor will burn out uh you can check that with uh, checking the ohms to, to see what it is normally and then you know and what you currently have uh, you also have on there, uh, it can get mechanically bound, um, you know, trying to push all those gears and stuff uh, after, you know, if the bearings start wearing out, you can potentially have a, a clock that's not working right. It might, it might time fine. Like if you're, if you're, you know, if you're doing a time check on it to make sure it, it's functioning properly, like let's say you're missing a defrost. Uh, basically, you know, I never just put it at, somewhere away from the pins that actually force this thing into a defrost i put it real close to it because then you're actually making it push up against which is gonna you know make it have a little bit more resistance you know a lot of times it'll run freely if it doesn't have anything to push up against but as soon as it tries to push up against the pins that dictate the defrost you know what you know what time the defrost happens uh basically it'll get bound at that point um so that's why i usually check it you know by turning it right before it ends up hitting one of those pins. So the number one thing I tell guys with defrost clocks, this goes with any clock, whether it's a Paragon, a Grosselin, um, a Robert Shaw, whatever it is. Number one thing, take your Sharpie and mark the clock. If you get the on site and you think there's the coils iced up and you think, and you want to verify that the defrost clock is working, just mark it, mark the sharpie, mark his ticket, and drop a dot right where the where the needle is and make sure it's rotating. Go about your business for like go get your hose, go get whatever you're doing. Uh give it 10, 15 minutes and make sure it moves. Don't touch it. Do not touch the clock at all, besides marking a dot on it. Because I see this all the time. Apprentices will go there and a walk-in freezer's iced up. First thing they do is they grab the clock. They start turning it. They click it into defrost. It goes into defrost. Everything's fine. They it uh, terminates out of defrost. It kicks itself out. It starts running or it starts moving on its own. And 24 hours later, it hits that same spot in the clock again, and it has a broken gear or uh, a bad spot in the gear, and it can't make it past that spot. Lo and behold, a couple days later, coils iced up again. Guy goes there, does the same thing, turns the clock, and it's just a vicious cycle. So I always tell guys, never touch the clock, you know, ever. Just, you know, mark it first, make sure it turns. You want to make sure it makes it past that point that you got there. And then same thing if you show up to a site and, like Brett said, it's like up against the defrost timer and it's not, uh, it's up against it and it's not going, mark it. 
and if it's not moving, then you got a weak you got a weak timer motor or uh, stripped out gear, something like that. Uh, other thing is uh, when you're doing these, just you know PMs, make sure clocks are set as uh, close to the correct time as possible. I mean, it just you know helps everything out. You know, just make sure that like they are set. You know, if it's eight a.m., try to set it to eight a.m. Um, obviously, they're they're going to lose places with power outages, but I mean, you could at least you know kind of look at that if you know you were just there and it's you know you set the clock and now it's way off, then you know okay, I got I got an issue with this clock. I mean, if you don't ever if you're looking at a clock and you don't understand how it's wired, this is the easiest thing, especially the Paragon. I tell guys all the time, take it apart flip it over just take take it take it off the mount and flip it over literally like look at the back of it there are two bus bars in there so you could split so in like an 81 45 20 which is the most common clock out there so that's a uh 208 clock with termination whether it be uh electric term it's electric termination it's got to be in almost every walk-in freezer you know in existence you know besides uh some Paragon or uh, Grosslands and some other, uh, you know, obviously when you start going digital stuff, but it's probably one of the most common clocks out there. So if you look at this clock, it has two different bus bars. So one and two are jumped together. Those can technically be two different legs of power. So you could have two different legs of power on there. There were now that reason they do this is so one can power the timer motor and three, which is your defrost, like Brett was saying, which is your normally open on the clock. And two only powers four, which is going to be your refrigeration. So if you look at this clock and you don't understand that, if you're like questioning it, you flip it over, you could see the two sets of contacts in there. One's normally open, one's normally closed. When you turn the clock and it, it clicks into defrost, you could literally watch the normally closed open and the normally open closed. You could you could see it on there, and then same thing with the solenoid. You see the solenoid wires, and it has a bar on it that kicks it out of defrost. So if you look at it like on an eighty-one forty-five twenty, X is your termination. So one side of your uh, your power for the solenoid coil comes off a of three. Okay, the other side comes off of X. So once X is powered from N, it's going to kick off your termination it's going to kick your termination solenoid forward and it's going to push the clock out of defrost so that's how you test that that termination solenoid if you short end x it should terminate defrost and then likewise if you get to a store and first things first like some of the old school all these still run on uh you know time clocks and temps or thermostats so you go there and uh you know, the, the clock's moving fine. You marked it. It's moving. You go to turn it and you go to throw it in defrost and it kicks right out right away. Boom. Kicks out. So get your meter out. You're going to throw your meter on, uh, on X and, uh, three. And if you get a uh, 208 volts there right away, you got to catch it quick. If you get 208 volts, when you go to click it in for a split second, it's terminating right away. So go ahead and remove the X terminal tape it off for right now and then throw it in defrost and test it. You have a defrost termination issue. So you have a three wire defrost or a two wire defrost termination issue. So that's one issue. If you go to turn it right away, it kicks right out of defrost and you have 230 volts or 110 volts, whatever that, whatever that control power may be, then that's your issue. You have a, you have a defrost termination issue kicking the clock out. So pull the X, let the coil defrost, and then figure out what's going on with your defrost termination, whether you have a bad three-wire clicks on, whether you have a bad two-wire clicks on, whether something's shorted in there. But um, that's how you would test the uh, the X terminal. Like same, Likewise, you want to see that thing terminate on, on temperature. You know, you don't want to terminate on time. You know, you're going to overheat it. So you want it to terminate on temperature almost every time. And then on a Paragon, you have the little dials where you can adjust the defrost in. You just push the little uh, selector down. You could change the, the time, and then you just have the trip pins. Um, save those trip pins. When you change a clock, take them out. Put them in your bag. Put them in your little parts mm -hmm. container because uh, you're going to get in, like, situations where, you know, you may have a, 
a newer case on a single unit with well, it you only it only comes with four trip pins an 81 45 20 paragon clock only comes with four trip pins okay well we started up a circuit the other day and one of my guys calls me and uh he needed a defrost today so he needed another set of trip pins and trying to find those at his fly house is a nightmare so I always hold on to that stuff and uh, keep it. And then if you're like going likewise, you're going to the uh, the Grossland clocks. Um, same thing. Now you have like a digital digital version of the pair or of the Paragon. So you have the Grossland clocks. Same thing. You can separate relays for defrost and refrigeration. You could jump them together. Now on the Grossland, you have like a you have to actually have a physical jumper in there. So you have to either add it, it's either there, or you have to uh, install a wire jumper for one to two. And then you could, depending on how you do it, the Grossland, the only like benefit to the Grossland is you can do 120 or 208 with the same clock just by flipping a switch, which is, to me, for truck stock-wise, is a little bit better. I mean, the clock's not as reliable as a Paragon Mechanical. I mean, Paragon Mechanicals are pretty tough, but... And the other benefit to the Grossland is you could add as many defrosts a day in there as you want, but you're stuck with a 15-minute interval. Today's episode is sponsored by the new Reefer Shield Differential Pressure Monitor from Westermeyer Industries. When the filter element of your coalescing oil separator is contaminated, it can hurt your system's performance and efficiency. But how do you know when it's time to replace that filter? Way too long to replace, and you could end up with a nasty filter blowout but replacing too often can be a waste of time and money. The answer is installing a differential pressure monitor. The new Reefer Shield RDP-01 differential pressure monitor is available now from Westermeyer Industries. To find out more information, email sales at westermeyerind.com. That's sales at westermeyerind.com. Yeah, where yeah, each one of the, the it looks almost like um, trying to think old something old school like related to it. basically um, cylindrical clock face uh, that has a little uh, you know a dip switch on a on a on a E two for the addressing. It's kind of comparable to that. Uh, and like Kevin sa- stated, um, it's a fifteen minute inter- interval, so you can't you know you can either go fifteen minutes, thirty minutes, forty five. And so on and so forth. But you, if you do have uh, some sort of termination, <clears throat> you can, you know, basically cut that down. Um, you know, on that uh, where you connect it from the three to three to X, uh, you know, that's where you have your termination. So you can have anything. You can have a pressure switch. Uh, you can have a, te- uh, a thermostat. You know, basically, you can put the thermostat on the. Uh, hell, you can put it in the discharge air if it's a medium temp case. You could put it on. Uh, you can put it on the on the coil. You can put it, uh, you know, anywhere where, where you think that you know. Make sure that you're gonna remove all that ice from there. Uh, anything there. Uh, pressure switch ones are, are typically used for um, non pump down systems, where basically it's uh, as the pressure goes up, your temperature goes up. Well, it, using that theory, you could basically set your defrost clock for whatever saturated that would bring you to whatever it's going to end up defrosting at. So typically we try to maintain, you know, 40, 46, 48 degrees um, on uh, freezers, maybe, you know, 50 uh, 50 to 55. Um, You know, basically if you're talking about doing it on pressure though, for a non pump down system, uh, basically you would set it to whatever saturated is going to make sure all your ice is going to melt. So, you know, let's just say we set it for a 48 degree saturated. So as soon as that pressure comes up, technically the coil should, you know, should have reached that temperature by then. And then basically it'll connect the circuit and, you know, force the uh, termination to end end the defrost prematurely before the ended up time. Uh, You do have, I believe you can do up to 120, 10 110 minutes uh total of the defrost time um they do make a particular uh time clock i believe the number is an 82 45 20 uh that is the defrost clock that also has the uh tap on there where it actually has a, a, su- a suction pressure um tap so that goes directly to the clock so it actually doesn't have an external uh pressure switch i don't 
not really a fan of this because, you know, if God forbid the pressure switch portion of it breaks, well, then you have to replace the whole damn clock. Uh, if, you know, if the pressure switch breaks, when you, if you're implementing into like a, you know, 80, 8145, uh, you know, you can basically just change out the pressure switch without having to change out the whole damn clock. Um, I get salty every time I see one of those, especially if you're trying to swap it out you don't want to, and there's no valves. It sucks. <laughs> you have yeah. used a pinch off or a pair of dikes and trying to like braze it shut because I mean, yeah. I never put one back in because like you never supply houses never have them. So I just end up throwing a normal defrost clock back in it. Usually I, I used to find them a lot on those um, self-contained. Like a self-contained coffin case at like the, at the big, uh, big warehouse stores like a BJ's or a Costco. Yeah, the Sam's used to have the same thing. Like the the little self-contained single deck bakery cases, always those things. I mean, yeah, the the other thing I want to talk about is now like Paragon makes a digital clock, which is a lot better. So they make a digital version of the 814520, and I believe it is dual voltage. So it is actually programmable and has a memory in it. So yeah, or a battery, so it never loses the time. So it's a digital version of that clock. So it's a digital version of the 814520, which is it is more configurable, and uh, it does not lose the cl- uh, timing. So it actually is nice for when you, uh, you're you putting it in somewhere and, like, you want to keep the defrost times all the same. Like, say, you write it down outside the walk-in, and you want the, uh, the manager to, like, actually look at it and, you know, not call you when it's in defrost. So they actually make a, it's a, they're 9,000 series universal controllers. So yeah, it is, it's 120 or 208. And uh, you can change the defrost times 15 minutes apart. So again, like this is what I would carry more. Like if I was, you know, doing a lot of like small single units, I would probably carry a digital Paragon. I mean, it looks like it uh, replaces just like the same. It fits right in like a, a uh, normal Paragon box, so you could just change it out without rewire or redoing everything, rewiring everything. Right. So, is like, that, that's a plus. Is that the one? Is that the one that has like the Ethernet connection between the actual body and and you know? No, because they make a defrost, defrost clock. Taking one apart, so what's that? I've never taken one apart, so no. I just I, there's a there's a certain manufacturer that has a defrost clock. That uh, that basically has a display, like a you know, like a small looks like an XR seventy five display or something like that, uh, or yeah, or yeah, X, yeah, XR seventy five. I don't know the the ones that are like you know, basically like an inch by like three and a half. Um, but well, that's the Ranko one. Oh, okay. The Ranko like defrost temp controller thing, like yeah, I, I haven't seen one of those in years. They were oh. using them on the on the Sam's Club on the uh, grocery pickup. You know, on the single, on the uh, self-contained units that were up were up in the front there. Yeah, I cut them out and put a Dixel. I'm going to be honest with you guys. Like, I carry a Dixel uh, 120 volt and a 208, uh, like an XR75 controller in my truck, like a universal. Like, the supply house have, has them, like 110 volt and 120 volt. Or I'm sorry, 120 volt and a 208 volt. They comes with two sensors. Like, I've been, I've been replacing defrost clocks with that for probably two years like especially at aldi and stuff like at the single units mm. um if i get a bad defrost clock usually we already like at all of our stores we already have like a, a digital johnson controls sat in there so i literally just cut the sensor off throw the dixel 10k sensor on there and then i just cut a hole in the front and put the dixel on there two benefits of this the store now knows when it's in defrost because it says defrost on the outside of the cabinet. And now there's an actual like temp display and I could do termination off of uh, uh, temperature also. And I have a fan relay. So yeah, good. Sorry. I mean, for what it costs, one of those Dixels is about the same price as a Paragon clock. So, I mean, I'm a big fan of those things. They work great. Whether you get a Corel, a Dixel, a Danfoss, doesn't really matter. They all do the same thing. I just like the Dixels because they're a little bit more, uh, you know, available. And then, like, I have a programming key for them. Like, I have a program on my computer called WizMate, which is you could download it at any time. I could literally 
I download the program. I like have one written for freezers and written for coolers where it has all the parameters in there. All I got to do is stick the key, the, the key in there and it literally downloads all my parameters in there. Then all I got to do is change the defrost time or the temp, you know, a little bit. Everything else is already set up and pre-programmed for me. So I can throw those things together without having to sit there and hold set plus down and all that stuff. I mean, let's be honest. It's, it's 2022. I mean, that controller is a thousand times better than a mechanical defrost clock. <laughs> Overachiever. <laughs> Hey, um, question. The CPC sensors, those are 10K type what? Which ones? Type, type two. Type two. Okay. For some other reason, I keep forgetting that a lot. The same sensor. Like they're, the Dixels and the CPCs are the same sensors. No, they're not. No, they're not. That's what I was going to bring up. They work the same. No, they don't. No, they yeah. don't. They're seven to eight degrees off. That's what I was going to bring I've up. Never, so I've never had one read off. I'm telling you right now. So the, the CPC sensors, like Kevin says, 10K type two. Those sensors that are in the dick cells, the universals, um, the the ones that are that have the black leads with the silver end, those are 10K type three. Um, so uh huh. So just change it to 10K type two. You can, or just use the sensor that's there. But what I'm getting at is like the you know when it, why the reason why it's called 10K is. Uh, basically at 77 degrees or what they call ambient, you know, it's, it's going to be 10,000 ohms. What's different about the type two to the type three on the lower end of the curve, when it starts getting down to where you're actually going to be utilizing the temperature range, the, uh, the temp, the temperature is off. So if you, the case is pulling down to, uh, you know, 30, 35 degrees, uh, it actually physically might be, I forget it's either going to be lower or higher, but what I do know is that it ends up if you're using that, uh, the other sensor for, if you're not using the discharge air one for termination, you're still, uh, you know, potentially going to ice up, um, because now in the lower control range, you know, down towards the thirties and forties, the temperature is going to be off for what the resistance is. So basically you could be colder than what you physically are. And then, not do a full defrost so just be mindful that you're putting in the right sensor and yes as soon as you put it in check the temperature when the when the case is you know at you know 70 or 60 degrees it's going to be damn near both are going to be reading almost exactly the same as far as um you know the vol uh the voltage or the resistance and the and the temperature but when you start getting down in the you know control uh control portion where it gets down to the 30s and 40s that temperature is going to be off per the resistance so it will give you just make sure you put in the right damn sensor. I didn't think you on the universals. I didn't think you can change it. I, I'm going to have to look at that. Cause I'm not, I'm not hundred percent positive on that. You can, you can, you can definitely change it with WizMate. That is for sure. Yeah. But not everyone has WizMate. Uh, looks like we're going to be doing a video. You know what? I, I think I have a, a universal. I'm going to, I'm going to hook up with WizMate and see, see if I, what I can do is seeing that. Cause I've, I've never, I've never hooked up a universal WizMate to be honest with you. Um, yeah. um the last thing I want to go, go over real quick, uh, before we go move on to something else. Um, so the Paragon clocks, you could actually pull, not Paragon, uh, Crossland. You could pull the four screws out of the front of the, like the timer motor, mm -hmm. and say you got a bad timer motor. You don't have to unwire the whole clock. You could pull the four screws out of the out of the timer where you turn it, and you could pull that timer off. It's just the spades are just sitting in the board. You could pull that timer off, take it out, and just swap a timer. Oh, okay. Like so that. same thing if you got a bad termination point on there, you could just swap it out. Or like if you get some like, uh, this is notorious like Barker, they were taking those clock faces. You could actually, you could actually plug wires right into that clock. If you're using pilot duty stuff, you could plug wires right into that, that timer motor. Mm -hmm. Like it, all the contacts are in there, but it's only pilot duty rated. So you could do a solenoid off of that. You could, you can't control like a defrost load well, you could control a defrost contactor. So if you're panel mounting that, you don't need the whole clock. You could take that piece apart. And if you're only using it to drive pilot relays, meaning like uh, you're driving a relay to control defrost, you could use just the clock portion. So if you need something like real small, like that works out great. 
it's made to come apart. So like you pull the four like silver screws out the front and pull it off. Mm-hmm. And uh, you could actually hook spades up to it, like female spades and use it. Um, now, last thing I remember, the last thing I haven't seen one of these in a while, but um, rack defrost timers, gang timers. When was the last yeah, time you yeah. seen a timer? Uh, four weeks ago. Really? Yeah, I seen one <laughs> a while ago. So a gang timer, guys. They're still out there on occasion. You see some independents with them still. Um, usually, when you see a gang timer. Um, it's usually in a store that is in not very good shape. Um, let's be honest, the parts are getting harder and harder to find for these things. Um, you're going to be hard pressed to go to a supply house and find a gang timer motor or any parts for it. But Paragon, I'm not sure if anybody else made them. I'm not, I'm not really sure. I've, I've barely seen these. So these gang timers, um, basically it was before you had, controls like cpc or dan foss or any of this you had you had to schedule defrost in iraq so what they did is they had a gang of timers basically just like it sounds gang timer you had a a bank of timers you had a motor driving individual cards basically so these cards had uh it was individual defrost clocks and you have this main motor driving all these so you have all kinds of different modules you could have with these. You could have uh, even hours, odd hours. You could have uh, ones with termination, ones without termination, ones with uh, two poles or single poles. But the way these worked is they had little uh, uh, selector knobs on them. You would like push it aside and select your defrost time. And then you would put these like trip pins like they look like a little uh, horseshoe almost with uh, brass on. You put these trip pins in there for whatever hour you wanted to go into defrost. And when the trip pin came around from the motor, it would open the normally uh, closed and close the normally open. They would go into defrost. And this motor would drive everything. And if it, if it had a termination solenoid, it would kick it out of defrost, just like a normal, normal defrost clock would. So it is imagine having 12 defrost clocks you know, but in a, you know, length of one that's, you know, maybe as wide as uh, long as one eighty one forty five twenty, And you had one gear motor driving all these. But with this, you had one failure point. If the gear motor goes or the coupling goes or it binds up or the gears go, the whole store ices up. Yeah, the, the worst thing is, is when you have, you know, when you're there... <laughs> You know, you're testing testing the operation of the of the clock because, like you said, it's it's all you know multiplexed together. Um, and the worst thing is, like, you could have one clock in the middle of the freaking line that is just causing a binding up. Um, you know, that basically ends up you know taking out the fuse for the you know for the for the timer motor. And then once that happens, you know, like Kevin said, you're icing up everything. Um, you know the uh, and and, that, and that's the that's one of the biggest failures that and you know if if someone doesn't know how to you know clean up their control wiring after they're you know monkeying around with stuff inside the rack house uh you know i i've seen on multiple occasions where that that clock is turning and all of a sudden it gets you know it gets a hold of a loose wire and then you got either a pretty short pretty fire or ju- you know just a, a a big old mess on your hands so the great thing about those clocks, so there's eight modules in there. The greatest thing about those clocks is they are about two inches longer than a CPC board. So it replaces it perfectly. Yeah. You can literally just pull the wires right off the clock and land it right on the board. And that's how it should be because uh, those things should all be in the garbage by now. Yeah, they're reliable. They're not. Yeah. <laughs> Until a timer motor goes out. Like this happened at a uh, independent we had in my last shop. Uh, timer motor went out. Mm-hmm. And right about the time when the Rona hit, call all five big supply houses in Chicago. Nobody has a motor. Oh. United had two in well, the entire company. Even like even up in like Philly? Uh, that's where it ended up coming out of. Holy they had shit. two in the entire company. But it, 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 you got to remember like this is not a – it's not a uh, 
demand item anymore. Like, so they're not stocking. People aren't stocking this stuff anymore. So like, and then they can't get it from like Paragon and stuff. I mean, they're, they're probably, I, I would be hard pressed if Paragon was still actively producing those parts. Yeah. We, you know, I mean, you got to figure there's, there's no demand for it anymore. Yeah. No, everything's, you know, everything coming out is now all electronic control, you know, rack controllers. You got to figure it's probably cheaper to buy a CPC board than it is to buy a eight gang timer with a timer motor and the whole kit. It's probably cheaper. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, electronics have gotten so much more reliable. And so, I mean, but you're talking, this is old school stuff. Yeah, now I, you know, even mostly all the self contains now that are all coming out. I mean, you know, 99% of them now have, you know, electronic controls, you know, especially now with the, the R290 stuff, you know, everything has to be encapsulated as far as their controls. They have to be, you know, spark proof, you know. So basically the best way to do that is with a electronic control, not a, uh, you know, a uh, mechanical control anymore, right? With open, open, visible sets of contacts, right? I'm literally pretty sure those like Dix, universal Dixels are like seventy dollars. Yeah, they're fairly expensive. Um, so on the uh, what, you know Kevin kept referring to the defrost uh, or defrost termination solenoid uh, coil, and the re- the reason why he's referring to it is that is because that's exactly what it is. If you if you you know take a uh, you know one of the RM series the gang clock over and, and take a look at it, you'll see that it's basically just a piece of plastic with a uh, metal plunger on the inside and basically when you apply power to those you know two wires that are you know wrapped around it creates a magnetic field and then ends up pulling on that plunger when it pulls on the plunger it and that's how it's actually mechanically uh you know ending the defrost um i will be putting pictures up of you know all the stuff that we're talking about on the facebook group if you guys are interested um but for the, I mean, for the most part, you know, Kevin's right. I mean, they're, 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 it's as far as production wise, uh, you know, everything's going uh, energy efficient and, you know, let's, let's face it, you know, it's, if it can get a more accurate defrost, you know, we're not having to pull down nearly as far after defrost. So it ends up making the unit more energy efficient. And as we all know, that's where everything's going. You know, everything has to hit a certain UL rating, you know, and, it's just the way the, the, the way of the beast is where we're going, right? Yeah, um, I mean, w- once you see, like, I mean, a lot of these customers, like, smaller stuff, you see a lot of this stuff, more so the grocery side, I mean, we're, we're pushing more towards DDC control. I mean, obviously, most customers want to be able to, even, like, like Target, for example, has a ton of single units, you know, for their walk-ins and stuff, but it's all, it's all CPC controlled. You know, everybody's moving towards that. Walmart... You know, they're moving towards like KE2 and stuff. I mean, KE2 is replacing the defrost clock. I mean, there's just so many options that are, you know, geared towards replacements. And the same thing in the restaurants. You're seeing that, you know, everything's moving towards DDC. And I mean, uh, defrost clocks, you know, going away of the uh, the way of R22 and everything else. Well, I mean, I think that's going to cover it for tonight. Um, I just wanted to say thanks for everybody that's been listening. Um, uh, we had a great year uh, from, you know, from when we started in February uh, up to December. And it's just it's been an amazing ride. And we've met a lot of new people. And, you know, everyone's been been real cool about, uh, you know, listening to the podcast and keeping up to date. And I, I just wanted to say I appreciate that. Um, I did want to put out I will be at the AHR conference uh, down in Vegas. Um, I will be hanging out at the Sporland booth uh, for the first two days between 1230 and 530. Um, I'll be giving out stickers to all the guys that come visit and we'll be doing a drawing for some, for some, uh, shirts. Um, hope to hopefully get some, uh, patches by the time that I get down there, but that's all based off of, you know, when stuff can get delivered, but just let you know, come down and see me when I'm down there. Unfortunately, Kevin can't make it, but we will be at the HVAC, uh, school symposium down in Claremont, Florida. Um, I believe it's on the 7th, 17th of February. It's a three three day conference. Uh, if you guys can't make it to AHR, Kevin and I will both be down um, at the uh, at the HVAC uh, HVAC school symposium down in Claremont. So just come visit us, man. Yep. Likewise, guys, I really appreciate you guys listening, and uh, it's been a wild ride so far. 
But uh, if you guys could uh, give our YouTube page, uh, you know, check out and uh, subscribe so we could uh, get this rolling off the ground. We'd really appreciate it, guys. And like Brett said earlier in the uh, po- or in the uh, podcast, uh, if you guys got ideas you want to see, stuff you want to see videos on, programming stuff, we got probably eight videos sitting right now that got to be edited. And, I mean, we're churning them out. So, um, you know, get those requests in and we'll, you know, try to schedule it and, uh, you know, try to make a video. But uh, thanks for listening, guys, and uh, have a nice night. Hey, guys.